Welcome to On Air with Cash. Our guest today is an actress who you know from Pacific Blue, Boy Meets World, Full House, and of course, Back to the Future Part 2. She's probably the first guest I've had on who has actually been on a real hoverboard. Please welcome the great Darlene Vogel. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Cash. Darlene, you've had an epic career, and then there's just been this resurgence with Back to the Future because people will argue certain predictions were made, other things weren't. Yeah, good thing we're not wearing those clothes right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> the flying cars, the clothes, the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say Bob Gale pretty much nailed it on the head. I mean, when he wrote that script so many years ago, it's just so many things. I mean, even the World Series was close and he he was pretty brilliant writing that script. That was like one of your first movies. You were uh, Pacific Blue in the 90s. Then you were on all these t uh, hit TV shows, Boy Meets World, uh, Full House. And I think I got to know you because I'd done some stuff with the Hollywood Museum and they did have a Back to the Future tribute. They opened up the Back to the Future display there, yeah. I think we met briefly, you looked familiar, and then it was so bizarre because I just did a Charles Fleischer who's in it. I had just done a movie with his daughter, which actually Charles we just- Charles Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> just screened at the Anoho Film Festival. And then um, I know you did a film with Greg Grunberg, who was actually a client of mine when I worked at WM. He was one of my first jobs. Awesome guy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's uh, the nicest guy. And I know you had talked about that in an interview where Back to the Future wasn't something that you really talked about because it was a while back and you'd done so many right. other things. But then you started going to Comic-Cons and you realized, whoa, there's a fan base here. Right. I was really shocked. I didn't tell many people I was in that movie for 20 years because it was so old. And then we had a 25th year reunion and I was with Jason and Ricky, my gang members. And uh, we went to this whole reunion and, and people were there from all around the world, South America, Europe. I mean, everywhere. I was like, wait a minute, something's going on here. <laughs> I mean, there's a huge fan base and they're getting younger and younger, which is amazing. So yeah, I get invited to some cons. I really don't do that many. It's very hard for me to get away with my kids. Uh, well, one's in college now and one's here, but um, yeah, but it's when I do go, it's just amazing. People are like, I just came here to get your signature because they have everybody's signature, but mine, because I don't go around that much. And Jason, he's not available most of the time, but it's just such a great experience to be a part of that trilogy. I mean, I'm just, I, I now when I mention it to anybody, even my daughter's friends are like, oh my God, back to the future too. So it's pretty cool. I'm the cool mom. You're the cool mom. Oh, of course you are. <laughs> I was born when the first movie came out, but still like that was one of those movies that was just always on TV. I was always like drawing and we would like recreate the clock tower scene and all that. I had a cousin who worked at Universal and we got to like go and like see the clock tower when we were like little kids and we go to like Bates Motel, Boo Radley's house. Like, oh my God, we're like here on the clock tower. We're going where Jurassic Park is. Then the ride was there too. And then they took that. I was part of the ride as oh, well. Yeah. But not as my character, as a different character. But and then I, I'm really, you know, sad that they took that down because I think a lot of people really like that now. And I'm with you. I am so old school. I mean, what what is Universal without ET, without Back to the Future? Come on, we gotta right. we gotta pay tribute to the classics. Remember this? They had the special effects stage where they would you could get in the DeLorean and they would show you how to do effects. And I so I got it was. I think it, the movie had come out or whatever. I was it was early '90s, and I just remembered me and my friends. I'm like. There's flying skateboards. What that? We got it. And we we literally thought that was a real thing. Like we go into a skate shop and we just see the boards without wheels. I'm like, mom, I want a hoverboard. Give like we thought that th that I mean, for us, like for our imaginations as kids was just like, oh, my God, we want flying skateboards. And then, like you said, they had the ride come out. So uh, some family friends that we went to, we do like Horror Nights and we're on The Simpsons. And uh, so my friends were in their early 20s. Like they they know Back to the Future, but they don't remember the ride at all. So their mom pulls up. Oh, no, this is what it was. So we're waiting in line for The Simpsons. So, so she pulled, you can see the whole ride on YouTube. And I noticed, oh my God, there she is. You are in that, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who guides us. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun story because Joanna Johnston, who is the wardrobe, um, cost the costumer for Back to the Future, she suge suggested me for that role, and I was like, yeah, sure. So I was happy to get that. And then the day I show up, the teleprompter broke, and I was like, oh, great! I have pages, and pages of dialogue. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was that was a that was a tough one, but it, we did it. <laughs> oh, you did it, and I mean, those were my memories too. I mean, this is like you know, even just in the nineties. I mean, it was like we always were like fighting to get like. Who got to sit like in front of et and then like you know going yeah. to the sound stage and then of course the back to the future ride don't get me wrong I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the simpsons also grew up with them but it's like my thing is it's universal i mean you have to have a back to the future ride 
Yeah, with the DeLorean and we shot right there. It was so fun because I remember we used to walk around the back lot, you know, when our time was off and all the people would be in the tram and they wouldn't even know who we were, you know, because the movie hadn't come out yet. They were just waving all the tourists and it was so much. We were there for two months to film that scene. This was like one of your first acting jobs. And this is like, so it, it was supposed to be a two week job and it turns into two months. Correct. Yeah. I had done like some TV and stuff, but I walked into my agent's office and he was like, Darlene, how young do you think you could play? And I was like, I don't know. So because we'll go on this audition and I didn't even know what it was. And I just had a conversation with the casting director and then she brought me back a month later with Ricky and Jason. We just improv. And then I was like, I don't even know what this is for. And um, and it was funny because I had nothing on my resume and the casting director asked me, oh, you know, because everyone, every actor lies in the beginning of their career. And I was like, she's like, who, who did you do Fool for Love with? You know, this play, I go, uh, oh my God, I just blanked. I mean, I, I could have thought of anybody. I mean, I was friends with actors. I was friends with Luke Perry and Grant Show and those people back then. I could have said them, but I just blanked, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's a little tidbit that actors should have something in their back pocket unless uh, someone asked them a question like that. But uh, But she, I got hired anyway. Mm-hmm. But it was a three month process that we didn't know what we were doing and then two weeks to shoot, but then it turned into two months. So it was awesome. And, and it was such an innovative movie. I remembered been watching it so many times you know, on TV and I just started having those questions like, wait, how could like Michael J. Fox be here? And then he's right there. And how does right. like, my dad was trying to explain it to me because my dad's a big tech guy and I was in music publishing and everything as well too. And he was a big fan. I felt like that was really a movie where I got into how movies got made. I was just so fascinated with how could you do two things at the same time? How do you get the skateboards to fly? It's the sequel that goes into the original. As I got older, you're like, wow, that was so ahead of its time. And I feel like every time you watch it, you find something different, like little Easter eggs in there. That was the first time they used a camera, the split camera. And the lighting took a lot longer because of the special effects with that. So that's why the cafe took a a month and the flying took a month. And a lot of times we just be sitting around all day long waiting to work. Um, So they're setting up shots. We've had days like those on set, you know, I mean, I've said there's nothing to do. You do your few lines, but I mean, you're on Universal. You're where the magic happens. And I did hear something. Did you have a uh, happy hours with Michael J. Fox's trailer? Yeah, yeah on Fridays. Fridays. We have Margarita Fridays in his trailer. Oh, I am so jealous. Uh, that, yeah. been, that must have been so fun to just have those experiences and tell those stories. Yeah. Yeah, he was just the sweetest guy on the planet. He was he was so normal. You know what I mean? He was so nice. I haven't met him yet, but um, just everyone who I know who worked with him, you know, my good friend, Gabrielle Stone, her mom's Dee Wallace. I think she oh. was that nut. Yeah, with E.T. and there was that history with Universal. But, you know, I am heard when they were filming The Frighteners in New Zealand with Peter Jackson, um, her mom was in New Zealand and um, her father had a heart attack and passed away while she was a little girl and her mom had to go back. And, and then she get her. And then she came to set and she said, um, I mean, she actually wrote this in her book. Like Michael was just a very caring person would like play with her when he had break time and was just really being attentive. And so I've, I've heard that about him and uh, even yeah. just watched this documentary recently. It's, it's so tragic what happened to him, but uh, just what he's done for Parkinson's and who he continues to be and how he continues to inspire everyone. And a lot of the fans of back to the future continue to contribute to the Michael J. Fox foundation. So it's great. A lot more money is going into that because of Back to the Future, you know? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. You see, my other friend is Ziana. Her dad, uh, Danny Young. So he was in Marvin Berry and the Starlighters. Uh-huh. Yeah. And she's a huge fan. So we met in high school. And so this is like early 2000s. And so we're, um, she was like showing me pictures. I'm like, that's your dad. Oh, my God. I totally know the band and everything. And she's a huge fan. He actually, uh, they, he plays live at the Commons. And we actually, I met up with her family again. And we got to... Uh, watch his band play but uh yeah she ha- and um actually i told her because we were at um, another friend who i um i just wrapped a film with it's about ai it's kind of futuristic so uh, the, i'm the person who looks good on paper and then i'm competing with the ai guy but he shows up as su- he called it successful george mcfly he had the book and everything and um in the 80s and then um, i said it to my friend and then i actually told her um about you and, I, and about how you just had this fan base of the cons because she wants to She's always looking for ways to incorporate. So you coming back and everything and putting your character up there. There's not going to be a Back to the Future 4, but what would you say if someone came with you? A Spike backstory. 
Oh yeah. Well, of course it's always good to work and it's, you know, be affiliated with, but I don't think they're going to mess with perfection. You know what I mean? There's nothing you no, I'm, I'm not talking about a fourth back to the future. I'm talking whether it's a cart because they've had cartoons and video games and right. Bless me. Oh, and right. I they should, oh. they should do the cartoon and then we could go on as, as us. Yeah, they should. I mean, I just think that would be interesting I'm with you where it's like, I never wanted to see back to the future get remade or another sequel right. there. But as you were saying, you know, with, I mean, because I got to know the cons, you know, when I was working with like Greg Grumberg and I got into that world because I, you know, it was uh, at uh, William Morris. I was um, in the voiceover department. So I had uh -huh. clients who had fan bases. I'd go to cons and like people were like following me around and ask, oh, you know her? You know, she's wonderful. And I'm like, dude, I don't know, like all these like little side plots or whatever. I mean, you're irritating me, but I guess there's stuff online. I'm sure you get it too with your characters. What I'm saying is if someone came to you with the right idea, whether it was a cartoon or spin-off, it wouldn't go against Zemeckis or Gale or anything. It would be just kind of a unique thing about just whether it was like after after the crash in the clock tower on the hoverboards, it was like turning her life around doing a Harley Quinn kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what happens to her, right? Yeah. I don't know. Such a small part. I don't know. I, I don't know if they'd really focus on that, but who knows? You know, you know, for, I keep saying, look at how far Cobra Kai's come. Yeah, exactly. I think Pacific Blue would have been a great thing to bring oh, back. Yeah. That's for sure. But they talked about that, but it just never, they have a script and everything. Like I would come back as like a rogue detective and, you know, all this stuff. I go, I would love to do that, but you know, I'm getting old. So, I can't, you know, it's like, you know, you got to do it now or never. You are so not old, darling. I remember being in a, a Stein Erickson Lodge when I was about, gosh, this is in the 90s, it was my first time skiing and snowboarding. And uh, they and I, I saw, ski, it was just one of those movies that was on HBO. And years later, like you were in that film as well too. He's cool. I don't really, I mean, my, my daughter is mortified that I was in that movie. I go, oh, it wasn't even all me. It was all doubles. <laughs> You know, oh, right, I have, right. That's, yeah. I have a love scene in that movie, you know, back then, you know, when you film those movies, we didn't have internet. We didn't know these movies were going to live, you know, a, a long time on, on the internet. So, and back then you always had, they always had to put it in a love scene, no matter if you're the nice right. character or not for the European sales. And I'm like, Oh God, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> Oh, no. And I know that because when I first like got, you know, I did some stuff when I was a kid and then I was at the agency. Then I started working with um, Joan Jett's company and they did. They actually. So before they gave me like I was very fortunate to like like a starring role in their follow up. So they did the runways and there was this other movie, Undateable John. And no, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. But it was like there was this scene. It was a pretty intense scene with me and Estella Warren. And then Shannon Doherty turns out to be my sponsor i end up getting a gun pulled on me and beaten up but yeah i had to film a, a, a similar kind of a scene so i i've i've been on that receiving end yeah. so i'm at wme and this is like right when like entourage is like the hottest show i mean it was basically everyone wanted to be ari gold and like jeremy piven was a client he came in for voiceover i'd see those guys running all around town and there was this and uh kevin dylan you know the big there was a subplot like oh he, he had and he was pacific blue and yeah. then because of him, I started watching a few of those rooms like, oh, this is what it was. And then when I found out about I'm like, Darlene was in this as well, too. Yeah, I went. Well, I, so I just saw Kevin at a con in New Jersey. Saw, yeah. yeah. And I, I showed him that scene. I go, do you remember this scene? And I go, you weren't ever on Pacific Blue where he goes, no, no, I wasn't. I go, because we had so many people on that show. So I didn't know if he actually guest starred or not. But it was funny that they mentioned that he mentions that. And he goes, oh, you, we didn't, you know, you weren't in NYPD Blue. He goes, oh, it's Pacific Blue. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. That was really funny. We had a lot of Eric Estrada. We had a lot of 80s actors, you know, that were on that show. A lot of good guest stars on that. Leslie Bibb, it was her first role. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. From Iron Man. And um, I know. Yeah. Where... My first um, sitcom role was Charles in Charge. Okay. And that's when I first moved in town. But yeah, my first movie was Back to the Future. And then my second one was Ski School. And then from there, I know you did um, Full House. And, you know, my dad actually grew up with Jeff Franklin, who's the executive producer. So, I oh, was yeah. 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 It was, that was the best audition because I, I was like, I don't look like Bob Saget. I am not going to get this role. And I walk in the room and I knew Jeff Franklin because he's brought me in. And he was actually my neighbor at the time. And, um, and he, and he, I did the audition. He's like, that was a really good audition, darling. I go, yeah, right. Okay. Bye. And I'm walking out the door. He goes, no, no, really. It was a really good audition. I go, yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs> and then I ended up booking it. It's so funny. The more negative I am about things, sometimes I book them. It's very funny. Isn't that the way it is? So sometimes we, if I go in there overconfident, oh, this is it. Then it, you know, right. but then it's when you're, when you're tough on yourself and you put yourself through it, then it's like, 
I mentally put myself in there and got it. Yeah. Yeah. Full House was, was you know, I did two of those episodes and then um, Boy Meets World, four of those episodes. That was really fun. I don't remember those. It was when Sha I think Sean was, I mean, that was like Friday night. I just did a festival last week with a Christine Lake and it was on Step by Step. And she always says, oh, was I like your first TGIF crush? All those shows, Full House. I go, yeah. And then when I got Pacific Blue, I remember uh, Paula, the, my co-star, she had called me and said, Darlene, they're looking for like this really tough blonde you know, to play this role. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure my agents will send me on it, whatever. So I call my agent, they go, oh, Darlene, they're looking for like this tough, this, but because I always play the nice girlfriend and I go, Billy, that's who I really am. I'm really the tough chick. You know what yeah. I mean? I love that role, sarcastic, whatever. And then when I went on it, Bill Nuss, the executive producer, apparently I was the prototype for the role because he was like, we're looking for like a darling Vogel type, but he thought I wasn't available because I was shooting a pilot uh, with Rick Rosovich and that did not go anywhere. And so then when they were looking for a Lieutenant, I said, Oh, why don't you ask Rick Rosovich? I know he's available. And that's how that came yeah. out. That was really fun. That's of course everyone knows him from top gun, but a lot of people don't know, like even uh, the first Terminator was one of his first, movies he played sarah connor's um roommate's boyfriend who oh was, yeah. yeah yeah and roxanne he played the fireman of awesome. roxanne yeah he was pretty funny we're us millennials we kind of grew up with all these replaying all the time so it's so cool to like be able to work and meet some of you know the people who were like actually there and were part of the magic that made some of our classic movies uh, so special yeah I mean, every time it's so funny, whenever I watch Seinfeld, I know every single guest star that's on that yeah. show. And I'm always like, how come I did not audition for Seinfeld? <laughs> I think I looked too Californian. I think that was the thing. Who knows? But I couldn't believe I never auditioned for that show. And I love that show. Oh, that's a, that's still we, I mean, we were just watching a few reruns after Thanksgiving on the week. I just got back from my mom's place in the desert. And uh, I mean, mm -hmm. that's still like our goat. It's the one thing I, I know, right? It's the best show ever. I'll just sit and relax and have a good time and just laugh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You golf, right? I used to a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. Once you have kids, you're always saying, I used to, I used to, I used to, but um, I tried again and I'm not so good at it anymore. And now I just got, I tore my uh, bicep in my shoulder playing pickleball. <laughs> It's like everyone's playing pickleball. It's funny. And I'm pretty sure that's what it's from because I also do weights, but I think it was that. So now I just got a cortisone shot today. So now I can't play anything right now. Oh, I know it sucks because I really like playing it. <laughs> so, you know, because uh, my mom just moved to Rancho Mirage and I mean, pickleball is a big thing and she, but she has the golf, like I stay on the golf course and, you know, I'm, I'm like just in the morning, I'm like hitting balls and going to the gym and stuff. But there's, I see people just playing pickleball. It's a huge thing. And it's uh, so fun. Once you start, forget it. If you're addicted. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. And everyone thinks, oh, old person sport. No, it's not. You go to the, you go to this park over here in Santa Monica and it's all young guys, all young guys right. and girls. And they're just, I mean, blasting that ball. Oh, totally. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, well, when you're feeling better, you know, I might try, I'll try pickleball. We're up for a match or we should, uh, I brought up golf because I, I, lo I looked you up. I saw you were part of a celebrity golf tournament. I'm well, I used to be more. engaged to a professional athlete in the 90s. And when it was this off season, that's all we did was play golf. So I got really good then. But and then after that, I just play in the celebrity tournaments. Yeah. You, you have this legacy. I mean, you're part of Universal. And I'm just and we were just talking like Zion and all that. We were just talking about how there's so many interesting characters and we feel like the cons and you know, even without messing with the originals, whether there's, you know, some animation spinoffs or whatever, we're just loving that, like our characters and the real because I'll be honest, there's, there's a lot of things I watch nowadays. And like I watch movies for our entertainment. But and I, again, I don't know if it's me getting old, but there's just there's certain moments in cinema that you remember, you know, and then there's like certain things that like motivated us to not even I mean, because. Like there's so many people in tech who like said, you know, back to the future, seeing a hoverboard, like made me want to be an inventor. For me personally, I know it's because I'm older and I know it's not really a flying skateboard, but, you know, to like be a kid, see what's possible cinematically, you know, like filming an actor multiple times. I mean, right. you know, there's so many people who are engineers and technology. I mean, they, they tribute like back to the future for really like putting... Oh idea. yeah. I mean, I think the closest thing would be those hoverboards that everybody had for Christmas that everyone fell on, you know, and then they yeah. caught on fire. We had one. I got on one. It wasn't anything. It was just kind of like, Hey, we're at a Christmas party. They were the hot thing that year. So your stunt double did get injured when uh, flying through the courthouse. Yeah. 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 She fell 14 feet onto cement because the crane was off a little bit. Oh. And 
God. It was just off a little bit. If you if you slow mo the movie, you'll see she crashes into the pole instead of going through the glass and falling through on the other side. So um, yeah, she. I mean, she didn't die, but uh, well, she's passed away now because of a family dispute. That's a story. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, she uh, had multiple surgeries and she continued to work. My first stunt double backed out of it because she knew it wasn't perfected. I mean, it was a new stunt. I mean, who had ever done this before? I've seen some behind the scenes footage on the documentary. So you actually like were in harnesses and got to fly on the hoverboard for some. Yeah, we were in harnesses and um, our our shoes were. Yeah, we were strapped in and then you were in harnesses with piano wires going up into like a triangle and then swung around the town by a crane. Got it. <laughs> yeah. I started doing some stunt training prior to the pandemic. I mean, they put the wires in the harness. Like I did study martial arts growing up. Uh, actually, uh, Pat Johnson, he worked on a, you know, the original Karate Kid movies, The Ninja Turtles. He was actually the first sensei I broke a board with. So he was always sharing stories. And I've had multiple friends in the stunt world who, so they let me, um, you know, join them one day. And I was so grateful. And I was so bummed it, like literally two months later, the pandemic happened. So I'm, uh, I'm itching to go back sometime. And it was interesting because, you know, I've seen like Bob Gale, I mean, even political or whatever, but he kind of said there were all these comparisons to Biff and, uh, and 45. Yes. And, and I just I know, to- yeah, that's so funny when you see the second one. I mean, it looks like Vegas. He looks like Trump. It's so funny. Yeah. Some a fan came up to him to ask for an autograph. He loves everyone. But someone said, oh, what do you think about Trump? And he just says, oh, I, you know, I don't discuss politics, you know, unless it's a specific issue that I'm back. And I really admired him for being. But he then he just jokingly said, uh, put it this way, Biff became the president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When Biff's like in the casino, he poses a certain way and thing the because hair. Of- Oh, the hair, the comb. He said, oh, of course, too many. Parallels. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it was crazy. And all the gold that they put in where he lived. I mean, it's also, yeah, it's always good to be on set. It is. It's fun. And listen, you you have a legacy. You have a character that's gained this huge resurgence as a result of Comic-Cons and just interest in your movie. And so I I still think that you need to... there's something in the works for Darlene. Like, I hope so. I hope so. I, I think someone needs to come with you. The right. I'm just putting that out in the universe. You've done so many d- different things with your life. I'm really happy for your success. I'm really flattered Thank that you, you came on this show and that, you know, we got to talk about some of this stuff. And I know we've worked with a lot of the same people and just, yeah. and uh, so anyway, I uh, really, Darlene, just all the best. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day, you know, we can uh, be on set together and we'll have some new adventures. Hope so, yes, yeah, so if not the pickleball court. <laughs> hey, pickleball court and golf. You got it, Darlene. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Cash. Thanks, Darlene.